I see Selena is here and Inez is here and Deirdre. Great to see everybody. Again, Constantina, Mairead, you're welcome. Everybody, welcome. Okay, well, we're going to uh, we're going to kick off, and then uh, people can can join us as they arrive. Um, so absolutely delighted to welcome everybody to uh, to this webinar today. Um, it's called Leaving No One Behind, and it's about equitable access to surgery in rural Africa and in the area of SDG three. So we're all very very excited to hear more about um, about this work today, and um, we're really delighted to be co-hosting this particular webinar with Surge. Africa. My name is Nadine Ferris France. I'm the executive director of the Irish Global Health Network. And just to let everybody know, as always, a recording of this webinar is going to be available on the Irish Global Health Network website um, and the YouTube uh, channel. And we'll be we're live streaming right now on the YouTube channel. Any questions during the webinar, please put them to the chat box and we will do our best to, um, to direct them to, uh, to our speakers. Um, I'm co-moderating this session um, with um, Dr. Professor Ruri Brua, uh, Professor Emeritus Public Health and Epidemiology in RCSI, who's with us today from Ethiopia. No, Thank I'm, you, Nadine. Yeah. And that's my introduction, I think, is it? Well, it's just good to know that you're, we're co-moderating and what Rory and I are going to do is manage this together. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of our amazing speakers today and, um, and hear what, what they have to say. And then Rory is going to take a little bit over and, and start asking some of the questions and engaging with the speakers after that. So we have some really incredible speakers for you today. So just to introduce who we have, we have uh, Tia Kapalumala from she's a pediatric surgeon um, she was a, a fellow a medical fellow of the African Pediatric Fellowship Program at the University of Cape Town in South Africa she's a pediatric surgeon in the Mercy James uh, Mercy James Institute of Pediatric Surgery at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital and she is only one of four surgeons pediatric surgeons in Malawi so we're really privileged to, uh, to have you uh, with us today, Tia. Uh, she's also a COSEXA Council uh, County Representative for Malawi. Um, she's, she provided specialist training and supervision to district clinicians via the Surge Africa project in Malawi. So you're so welcome, Tia. Uh, welcome, welcome. <laughs> we're also joined by um, Karima Khalid. She's an anesthesiologist in Muhambili Orthopedic Institute in Tanzania. Um, Dr. Karima works as an anesthesiologist. Um, she's also a lecturer at Muhambili University of Health and Applied Sciences. She's the outgoing treasurer of the Society of Anesthesiologists in Tanzania, and she's a PhD candidate in essential emergency and critical care. So wonderful to have you with us today, Dr. Karima. Thank you so much. You're Bye. welcome. Good morning. Um, we're also joined by uh, Judith Montali. She's the Chief Nursing Officer in the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka. Um, she is, she's in, in Zambia, of course. Uh, she has a background in uh, operating theatre nursing. She's also a public health specialist. She's a past president of the Zambian Operating Theatre Nurses Interest Group and one of the Surge Africa supervisors in the country. So we're privileged to have you with us, Judith. Thank you. Welcome. We're also joined by uh, Professor Chris, uh, Chris Lavi. He's worked in Malawi also for 10 years, where he helped set up two hospitals and the National Orthopaedic Surgical and Clinical Office Training. He's an elected council member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. He was a commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, and he's led several health partnerships in Africa. Um, he's currently setting up a children's orthopedic unit in Zimbabwe, and he was awarded an OBE in the New Year's Honours List 2007 for services in orthopedics. So you are so welcome, uh, Professor. Hi. And then last but not least, we have um, our anchor, um, Jakub Jaweski, or Cuba, as, uh, as he is known to us in, in these here parts. Um, he's a health sociologist with extensive research experience. He was the lead researcher on the Cost Africa project, which implemented on-the-job training of non-physician clinicians in Malawi and Zambia. He's currently working as a program director for research in the Institute of Global Surgery at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. So incredible. Welcome. Welcome, Kuba. And thank you. We're delighted to be co-hosting this with you today. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. 
We're really excited to hear what a diversity of speakers we have and such interesting work. So we're really, really interested to hear from you. So I wonder if we could come to you, um, Chris, why don't we start with you and um, just hear a little bit uh, from, from you, from your perspective. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about your work. And you're muted at the moment, Chris. You're muted. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, intro for the introduction. Um, surgery and anesthesia, of course, is an essential part of healthcare. Globally, some 10% of all preventable deaths are due to surgically treatable conditions. And untreated surgical conditions cause enormous disability and suffering globally. Appropriate treatment of surgical conditions prevents unnecessary deaths alleviates suffering and also boosts the economy as people can get into or return to work and education. Surgical services in many low and middle income countries, particularly Africa, have been neglected for a long time in public health planning. And there are complex reasons for this, one of them being predominant interest in infections. And uh, infections are important and uh, TB, malaria, HIV, Ebola and COVID kill well more than 4 million people per year. But what many people don't, don't realise is that injuries and untreated surgical conditions are responsible for even more deaths than all those infections put together. Well, things started to change a little bit in 2015 when the World Health Assembly passed its first resolution or involving surgery and anesthesia, resolution 6815, stating that emergency and essential surgery um, are, are an important component of universal health care. In that same year, the Lancet Commission, which I was um, privileged to be part of, made a big contribution to understanding surgical need globally, as it tried to quantify the need quantify the lack of facilities and the lack of manpower and resources, and consequently the, the lack of operations um, with large numbers of patients being untreated. The Lancet Commission also tried to give pointers as to what needs to be done. Uh, for example, the, the, the Commission estimated that 5 billion people in the world, that is most of the world, had no effective access to affordable, safe surgical care where they lived. And to remedy this, there needed to be good essential and emergency surgical care at district hospitals. Why district hospitals? Because that's where the people are. District hospital surgical services differ in different countries and regions, especially across Africa. Some countries' district hospitals have trained surgeons and anaesthetists. Others, in others, the work is done by general medical officers and still others, as I'm sure we'll hear today, the work is done by non-medically qualified clinical clinicians. For me, it's been a great honour over the last five years to be part of a team involving the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland and surgical partners in Malawi, Tanzania and Zambia, looking at district hospital surgical activity and numbers and looking at how services can be improved, how clinical skills can be upgraded and maintained with mentorship, how standards can be improved, how referrals of minor things can be reduced and how referrals of major conditions can be made more efficient. But I want to sum up everything in just one sentence. The district hospital is at the heart of surgical services. Thank you. Thank Nadine, shall, shall I come in? Yes, please, Roy. Yes. So I, I thought I might come in first. I was going to steal Chris's thunder, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Chris's thunder came in first. Uh, um, many people uh, listening will, will know of me as a researcher and, and uh, uh, somebody who talked if I wasn't an expert on COVID. And that's, I have been a researcher for 25 years and I have been uh, sort of co-leading this team, the Surge Africa with Cuba. Um, but before that, I was a public health specialist for five years in, in Africa. And before that, again, 
I spent six years as a district uh, hospital doctor. And that's actually the perspective I think that we would like to bring. And, and, and Chris has given a, a very, some very good sort of facts to support that. The, the district hospital is the platform for just about everything that we do in health in Africa, at least in the stable countries I've worked in, such as Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania. And the cornerstone of the district hospital is the ability to carry out an emergency cesarean section uh, and, and a laparotomy for an acute abdomen. And uh, I started in the early 80s, but right back in the 1960s, it was the point that stuck in my head that Morris King made. If, it, if a hospital cannot do that emergency cesarean section or laparotomy, the people around it will not consider it a hospital. Now, in the heart of my experience and, and what has, has really um, um, fed into and, 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 and in, in enshrined in Surge Africa is the notion of the teamwork. <clears throat> when I started as a district medical officer or district hospital doctor, I really couldn't do surgery at all. <clears throat> teamwork involves having somebody who can put the patient asleep and more importantly, wake them up again. And, and, and that's where uh, Dr. Karima will, will, will speak to. Um, and uh, the teamwork for me, I learned, I, I had a trained surgeon who did help to train me, but I learned more from the clinical officers and the nurses around me. And what Surge Africa about is about, and what, what this uh, webinar is about, is to just to give you a flavor of uh, how the different professions have come together. We did a previous project and we just focus on the surgeons. And that was where we learned that it's about the, uh, the uh, anesthesiologists and the people they train and supervise and the nurses, because without them, the theater nurses and the ward nurses, you simply cannot do surgery. How they work with the clinical officers and with the specialist surgeons. So it's, it's a bringing together of these different professions. It's a bringing together of North and South uh, us northern researchers bring technical input, but the ownership uh, and the and the adaptation of the Surge Africa model and the buy-in from the senior level ministry, that's what comes from our partners in the South. And we hope to, today that you, you will get some flavor of what Surge Africa has been trying to achieve and, 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 and we believe will continue to grow long after uh, the project is finished. So... I'll hand, hand back to you there, Nadine, now to uh, yeah, bring in uh, Tia, is it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rory. And thank you, Chris. Um, so we're off to a great start. And Tia, you're going to uh, whisk us away to, to talk about surgical services in rural Malawi. So over to you. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to take you through about surgery in Malawi. Um, me being one of the people that was involved in the working under Surge Africa project in the fields. Um, just important to mention that uh, surgery in Malawi is a slowly growing specialty. Um, yes, we are still in limited numbers, very limited numbers, but um, not as we were yesterday. Um, current surgeon to patient ratio in Malawi, um, not pretty sure, but much, much less than what's recorded for um, the Kosetsa region, which is about 0 0.5 in a thousand, in a hundred thousand uh, population. So this is much worse in the district hospitals uh, because uh, um, in Malawi, all surgical specialists are working in tertiary hospitals in uh, urban areas <laughs> and either public tertiary hospitals or uh, private hospitals in the urban areas. And uh, in the district hospitals, there's essentially no specialized um, surgeons. Um, the people that do surgeries in uh, the district hospitals in Malawi are the non-physicians, clinicians, uh, whom we really rely on to do all these surgeries and um, uh, make the right diagnosis with regards to surgery. And most of these non-physician clinicians have uh, lent the job of doing surgery on job, basically initially out of interest, when they got the opportunity to have some visiting surgeon, then they would learn. And sometimes from their colleagues who had a bit of skill um, in doing different surgeries. Uh, only recently, some of them have had formal training um, in the recently introduced uh, uh, BSc in surgery. Uh, so basically in the district hospitals, we rely on these non-physician clinicians. 
And um, there are quite a lot of challenges uh, working in the districts and especially like the times that we're just starting to work under the project of Sage Africa, we learned quite a lot uh, about the challenges that they face in the districts. Um, one of them is that there are limited number of uh, these clinicians who are able to do surgery and some it's just because they don't have the interest. So you can imagine, for example, you have one uh, one of these clinical officers who is able to do or manage these uh, surgical conditions. The time that they're on holiday uh, or they're, they're sick, the little access that people in the community has to surgery is becomes even um, more limited. And uh, the, the environment is not so ideal. Um, for example, we've, we learned quite a lot uh, on our WhatsApp groups to say, for example, sometimes they wouldn't have a good theater lights, um, equipment was an issue. Um, and again, not some, basically just not adequate knowledge uh, on pre-op care, intra-op care and post-op care just because of lack of support from more specialized uh, surgeons. But with, um, uh, continued supervision uh, that uh, Sage Africa brought in, uh, I think these, some of these uh, are got better. Uh, so just to say, I think um, to achieve the much desired uh, uh, access to safe surgery, there is need for continued support in the district hospitals um, uh, from the Minister of Health through the district man management teams basically providing ideal environment and the much needed equipment and I mean, supporting training of um, uh, more uh, non-physician clinicians to improve human capacity and um, also support from um, uh, different specialists, surgical specialists. Um, one, continued support and um, supervision on job or just being available uh, to discussing and, uh, and providing a guidance on management of, uh, of surgical patients. So basically that's the, the situation uh, with regards to surgery in the Driscoll hospitals and uh, in Malawi overall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Tia, and thank you so much. And I know Rory and, and people who are watching will also have more questions for you in, in just a moment. So thank you for that. Um, going to come now to, uh, to Dr. Karima. And as Rory said, um, it's so important, you know, who's able to put the patient to sleep and, and more importantly, wake the patient up. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of your work in um, anesthesia? Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And um, as uh, Dr. Chris said from the beginning that we all know that uh, surgery without anesthesia is not possible and we have to work together as a team. So with the introduction uh, of the Lancet Commission, you know, the, the, the move that uh, included anesthesia in the surgical team and the, when they started seeing the importance of anesthesia, we were so delighted. And uh, with that, in Tanzania, we had the development of the National Surgical Obstetric Anesthesia Plan, which uh, the country has taken up. And uh, uh, we were able to see or to progress uh, together and work together with the surgeons, the obstetricians, as a team to the, and the nurses uh, to work together and develop a plan for Tanzania. And as he said before, that uh, we know that the district level is where the patients are, that is where people are and where, that's where surgery takes place. So we have a lot of challenges still in the, in, as a country at the district level. A lot has been done through the plan. Uh, one of the major uh, leaps that you have taken as a country is in infrastructure. We have a lot of centers that have been, uh, have been put up. Uh, the uh, theaters have been built, new theaters have uh, been put up in the country, in different areas of the country. And with that also, there's a lot of equipment that has also been procured and has been put in place. But we are still having a big challenge in, in anesthesia in terms of uh, human resource. So we have relied more on the NAS anesthetists at this level. As a country, the number of anesthesiologists has been growing. Uh, in the recent years. Uh, previously, we used to have one or two anesthesiologists uh, per year being trained at the university.
But nowadays we have at least 10 anesthesiologists being trained on average. And the numbers have gone up from like uh, 10 in the last uh, eight years to now around 60 plus anesthesiologists in the country, which is a good thing. But still we have uh, not a very good distribution of the, the anesthesiologists in the country. More they, of them are based in the big cities like Dar es Salaam, uh, Mwanza, Kilimanjaro. We have now people in Bea and Dodoma, which is a good thing. So we have tried, uh, so most of the anesthesia actually is being given by nurse anesthetists in uh, our country. And these uh, have different levels of training. We have those who are trained on job and we have those who are, who are gone through a six months training and, uh, and the others that have gone through a one year training course. So we need to support them uh, because they are not able to work alone and uh, they need a lot of support and advocacy for their voices to be heard. Being nurses, they're not able to have a very high voice uh, and their, their needs are those of a doctor kind of, you know, they need to prescribe drugs. So as a nurse, they're not allowed to prescribe these drugs. So they have they face a lot of challenges and they need a morphine for their patients, they need this and that. So their representation has been a bit of a problem and they're not able to voice out what they need. So what we have tried uh, as uh, as a body, the professional body, the search for a sociologist, is to work together with different organizations and bring about mentorship programs that are able to support our nurses, uh, and at the same time trying to increase the number of anesthesiologists through different programs like the MD program in the universities and the and through Canexa, which is a regional uh, um, um, College that trains anesthesiologists. So we're trying to improve the to increase the numbers, and at the same time, also we are training more nurses uh, who, through the one year program. And uh, we also have a training program that uh, is training them to do a degree program at the university. But at the same time, we we are trying to support them through this partnership through mentorship programs. For example, the one we had with uh, we've had with Surgery Africa, we have also with our main partner WFSA, the World Federation of Search for Anesthesiologists. We are running programs in um, Bear region, and currently we are going to start another one in Tanga and in Zanzibar. And we also have a, a, a one of our other partners, Gradient Health, that we're trying we're trying to also run partner, partnerships. Uh, mentorship programs in areas like Lindi, Mtwara, Tanga, and uh, and uh, one regions and in uh, di different areas uh, of, uh, of work that is being done in different regions of the country to improve so that they, to improve their care that they can give to the patient that they're dealing with. So the nurses are not left alone. They have the support from the doctors who are mentoring them and the mentorships are usually run through physical visits, uh, supportive supervision, and we also do WhatsApp calls. We support them through WhatsApp groups that we have with different regions and in different groups uh, that we have. And also we have a lot of uh, support through calls and we also visit them physically to support them and, um, and guide them as they, they proceed in giving care that is safe to the patient that they deal with. So mostly that is what I can say as an introduction of what is happening in Tanzania in the front of anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karima. Um, that was really very thorough and, um, and a broad introduction. Thank you so much. Um, and you speak of the, the nurses and that's just perfect as we go to speak to uh, Judith. And um, we'd love to hear from you, Judith, around the role of surgical nursery, nurses in the delivery of safe surgery. Over to you, Judith. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be on the panel. I wish to start by saying that I was one of the supervisors for the Sage Africa Mentorship Program, which we did uh, going to the district hospitals. So surgical nursing, you, you as a surgical nurse when you undergo training, which is extensive and uh, you work in a surgical unit. So there's even a more further specialized training where we train nurses to be perioperative nurses and to work in the operating theaters of our country. 
Uh, with the political will, we now have five training uh, schools for operating theater nurses where they acquire an advanced diploma in teleoperative nursing. And we have seen a lot of uh, theaters opening in our country in the sub-districts as well as the districts. So despite having the five schools, uh, the nurses are still not enough to cater for all these theaters. So the theater nurses role is very critical and very diverse. So you give care at three points of care. You give care during the pre-operative era, which starts from the ward when a patient is admitted and decision for surgery is made. Then you have to look at the psychological and physiological care and preparation of that patient before you can take them to the operating theater. When you are happy with the care, that patient will now be taken to the theater. But the theater will also have a team in place, which we call the surgical team, where we have nurses, doctors, anesthetists, and support staff who help with the housekeeping. So the team in theater will have what we call a theater briefing early in the morning on a day of surgery to look at a theater list that has been prepared. So this theater list will have all the patients who are supposed to come into theater and you look at them individually and their needs as a team. So as a team, you set yourselves for the day's work and ensure that everything is in place so that you don't have to run around when surgery starts. So that is still the pre-operative phase. So when the patient is now in theater, you now have to go into the intraoperative uh, phase. So all these phases are very important as a role in the uh, delivery of safe surgery to patients. So during the intraoperative phase, the nurses world over have been seen to be more, um, to give more emphasis on the checklists which are used in the theaters for safe surgery. So right now we have a standardized the checklist by the World Health Organization, which is called the World Health Organization checklist. It has three phases where you sign in a patient before surgery, just before induction of anesthesia, the patient will be signed in so that you have the right patient in theater. And then after that you, do the time out period where you ensure that before an incision is made to the patient, you are supposed to ensure everything is in place. You estimate the duration of surgery. You ensure you have sterile instruments and the equipment that is needed to avoid running around during surgery. And then after surgery, you have the sign out phase where you have to look at the post-operative care of this patient. Because this patient, before they are wheeled to the recovery room, you are, the doctor is supposed to give advice on the care that should be given from there. So it is very important to be a theater nurse because you give all this care to prevent uh, adverse events during surgery. The other issue that we tackle as theater nurses is the use of a surgical count. So the surgical count will ensure that um, all the equipment that will be used on a patient where there will be invasive surgery is, in, is counted at the beginning and at the end of the surgery to prevent leaving items inside the body cavities of patients. So this is very important for us. And then looking at the work we're doing with Sage Africa, going out to the districts, when we just started, there were a lot of gaps. Gaps like you find these nurses with very low confidence levels. They are not able to approach maybe even management to request for the things that they need to use in the theaters. Maybe one of the reasons would have been because there was very little surgery being done. So Just because one minute very, left, Judith, thank you. There was little surgery being done. The nurses would be allocated in other areas and not in theater. So they lost a lot on their skills. So we had to revamp their skills, start giving them the confidence levels, teach them how to prepare theaters. And all in all, I would say 
continuous mentorship and coaching is very important, especially for the district level hospitals, for these nurses to be competent enough to ask for what they need to care for the patients in theater. Thank you. Judith, thank you so much. Uh, what an incredible picture we're getting of the team, uh, this team that Rory spoke of. And um, thank you so much for bringing it to, to life for all of us. Um, and Cuba, your role then is in terms of researching surgery at the district level. So what can you tell us about that? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak about the importance of research. And I think in RCSI, we should be proud of ourselves because We've been researching district level surgery for over a decade, and uh, I think we are the only group in the world with such a long standing commitment to improving access to surgical care in sub Saharan Africa using implementation research programs. So, up to date, we've learned a lot, but uh, frankly speaking, it feels like we only touched the tip of an iceberg uh, uh, compared to what we need to know. There is still much more that remains unknown and yet to be revealed, and there are some big questions that still need to be answers and that need to be answered. But I can just tell you briefly about what we do know from the data that we've collected. The, the, the studies that we've done, all of them confirm what the previous speakers emphasized as well, that there is a, the, the importance of district level hospital as the, as the cornerstone, of, as, as the essential element of, of a strong surgical system. In the ideal world, district hospitals should manage the majority of the most common surgical conditions, such as, such as life-saving life obstetric emergencies, basic general surgery, such as hernias or simple traumas. And we studied who accesses surgery at district level and the vast majority of patients are about 25 years old. So in the productive age or reproductive age, majority of them were pregnant mothers and men and women with simple general surgery issues as well as, as, well as children. For instance, children falling from trees where they're asked to pick up mangoes or uh, children with burns uh, um, from, the, from the hot stove. Um, so, the, 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 these people need, need surgical care and the district hospital is supposed to be equipped enough to provide such care. Secondly, from the economic side of things, we've learned that surgery at district level is much cheaper than surgery of the same kind provided in a tertiary or referral hospital. So for instance, using Zambia as an example, we found that uh, hernia operation, a simple case of hernia operation at district level would cost around 1000 US dollars. And for the same case to be done at the specialist level, we would need to pay $2,000 for the exact same procedure. So for hernias and for other procedures that we research, I'm using hernias as an example, there is about 50% price difference per case, which means that uh, it, it, it makes a strong economic case to invest in scaling up surgery for patients living in rural, access, uh, rural areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, because these operations can be cheaper for the healthcare system as well for the patients if they don't need to travel to, to access uh, the care they need. Just you know, if they can access it close to their homes. Thirdly, we also learned about the importance of having a robust referral system, which requires good communication and collaboration between specialists at central level, what uh, Tia was talking about, and, and all of the panelists emphasized the role of uh, specialists in supporting this level uh, providers and enabling them to uh, refer what they need to refer and uh, retain locally and, uh, and, and provide surgery locally with the quality assurance uh, provided by, by, by uh, supervising uh, specialists. And lastly, we also learned uh, something that was mentioned by, by, by others that non-specialists in districts can work very well if they're adequately supported by specialists at central level. And in our study, we compared patient reported outcomes of hernia operations for patients reported, uh, operated at district level versus patients operated at central level. And we found the outcomes were very similar, which was encouraging and, and confirming the quality of surgical services that can be achieved with non-specialist uh, uh, providers. But there are also st still uh, big questions that need to be answered. For instance, we don't know what, is this, what are the essential elements of surgical system that need to be in place for district facility to make surgery safe. What is the minimum level of equipment or equipment or staff? That varies from country to country. And although there are general recommendations such as guidelines provided by the WHO, we learned that in all global health initiatives and all in life experiences, we learned that no size fits all and each country needs to respond to its own unique needs. Secondly, we also don't know, which is a major problem at district level, what is the essential package of surgical services that every district hospital should offer? It's on the surface, it's, uh, it sounds like an easy question, but if you were to consider the local circumstances of any country, the answer becomes more and more difficult. 
because the training is different, the equipment availability is different, the supplies are different, the patient profile is different. So everything that, that needs to be taken into consideration when the essential package of surgical services is defined. And as having an essential package of surgery defined will provide some sort of an assurance for district level providers about what they can do safely and what they cannot safely do and what they need to refer. We also still need to work out what are the best ways to support the work of district level clinicians uh, because the working conditions are very difficult and our studies found that the retention is, is, is rather poor and motivation and, and, and professional support uh, is non-existent That's in, in certain cases. So there needs, needs to be a lot of thought put into uh, interventions addressing these issues, making people work comfortably in these district level, rural, remote, remotely located facilities. So the lessons from our 10 years of work in Africa demonstrated that scale up of surgical services is possible and will become easier if we all recognize the importance of surgery in achieving the objectives of SDG3. Surgery is often perceived as a separate discipline for other healthcare, uh, from other healthcare areas, such as maternal health, for example, but in reality is an integral part of the essential package of basic health services that should be universally available. And surgery needs to be given adequate attention moving forward. And in particular, the Surge Africa experience, the Surge Africa project taught us that uh, bringing people together is crucially important in achieving the goals of SDG3, because surgery, as we've heard before, is a team discipline and we need to work as teams. We need to work as teams of health researchers, brought from, like Rory was saying, from both, both from North and South, sharing experiences and learning from each other. Teams of policymakers sharing experience and expertise. Teams of surgical experts, surgical specialists from across disciplines and from countries where we can learn from each other about interventions that, that, that can, we can roll out from one place to another. We can move and, and improve access to care for our patients. And together was, was togetherness as a concept was the key thing that we used in South Africa. And uh, I would like you to spend two minutes watching our shown video that we're just launching today. It's, uh, it's, it has never been shown before. And I, I hope that this video is going to help you to understand the concept um, a little bit better. Thank you very much. Great, Puba. So I think we're looking at the video now. Together, things are different. Goals are easier to achieve. Cooperation has been our most powerful tool in history. Together, we can succeed as families, as teams, as communities, as countries. Working together defines us. Living systems powered by one rule, togetherness. This has been our vision when designing an intervention to scale up safe surgery in rural areas in Africa. Because working together is especially important when health is involved, when we care for each other. That is why we brought people together who often worked in isolation, with the purpose of strengthening interactions and connecting realities. Surge Africa is a story of connection of how surgery specialists and district hospital surgical staff worked together, sharing knowledge and skills and supporting each other. A story of equity, of how to bring essential surgical services closer to communities so that patients and families can remain together and support their loved ones in times of need. A story of collaboration, of how the whole surgical system can benefit from connecting all its components to utilize its resources more effectively and efficiently for the benefit of patients. This story has just begun, but one thing is clear, to get better, faster, greater, wider impact, we need togetherness. Great, Kuba. R really good. And my, I might just say to all of you listening, uh, Kuba has managed to sum up about 10 years of output, it's an incredible uh, out output. And just look at our website, Surge Africa, and you'll see all the publications there. They're very accessible. Now, I'd like to move uh, to each of the speakers with kind of one big question and, and, and encourage them to maybe just develop from it. And I'm going to start with our, our speakers uh, from, from the countries where we're implementing Surge Africa. And I'm going to start with you, Tia. 
Um, and it's actually, it, it wasn't the question I was thinking uh, that I talked to you about earlier. It's, it's why is Malawi such a success? Because some people have this, I think, a false impression of Malawi as a country which isn't as dynamic as some other countries, but it's been the big success in cost Africa and surge Africa, because we want to think about transferability. What, what can other countries learn from Malawi? Right. Thank you for that question. I'll uh, try and respond to that. Um, so, firstly, I think uh, it's been access. Uh, it's been a success basically because one insight among the surgeons to realize that um, there is a gap in uh, surgical services in Malawi to safe se in the limited access to safe surgery in Malawi. So that insight and um, accepting that uh, in the district hospitals at at this point in time surgical specialists wouldn't by themselves manage to provide the much needed surgical services in the district hospitals. As such, um, the specialists were so much interested to teach and to teach the skills, the knowledge to the people who are already available in the district hospitals. And in addition to that, um, trying to be as available as possible to guiding and supervising the non-physician clinicians in the, in the hospitals. And again, um, on the side of the uh, clinical officers who uh, we rely so much on in the district hospitals, they also had so much interest uh, in um, developing their own skills in providing these surgical services. So I think um, overall, just having the insight and um, realizing the gap in the surgical services in Malawi by the specialists, as well as the interest of the uh, uh, clinicians in the district hospitals has contributed much to the success uh, uh, um, of providing the surgical services in the district hospitals. Yes, indeed. And, and I think having been with the, both the projects, Cost Africa and Surge Africa from the start, I think uh, it's the very huge need uh, in Malawi, which is the most rural country in Africa in terms of where the population are based, is that very need, I think, really called for this response. And, and I, I, I don't think that the, the, the doctors, the specialists have been more committed in any other country than in Malawi. So it, it's great to see the success. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about the WhatsApp group. I do encourage people to look at the publications there. Really exciting how technology is being used uh, in Malawi. So, uh, Dr. Karim, I'm going to move to you. Uh, and I must say, I was a, it was a great presentation, as, as was yours, Tia. Um, and really what came across is the very vibrant specialty uh, that anesthesiology is in, in terms of activities. Um, a, a, a question that we have had from the beginning is getting specialist buy-in to the surge Africa model, firstly with the surgeons, and then with the an anesthesiologists. Can you tell us how, how you've done that in, in, in Tanzania? What, and have there been any obstacles to getting you know, people at the national level to really buy into working with non-doctors, uh, trained anesthesiology, clinical officers and nurses. How did you manage that? Well, thank you so much uh, for that very relevant question. Um, it is a challenge uh, getting to getting specialists to work with uh, nurses, uh, having a very vital role in the care of a surgical patient. We all know that the doctor uh, the surgeon will be leading the surgical part, but the well-being or the physiology of the patient which going to sleep and waking up is in the hands of the anesthesia provider, be it a doctor or a nurse. And we know that at district levels in our countries, we rely more on the nurses who have been trained to a certain extent, but are not as much as the, the specialist doctors. So it has been a challenge uh, getting the doctors to listen or having them, uh, you know, understand how they will respond to a nurse. But uh, with uh, programs like the ones we're doing with Surge Africa and other mentorship programs that we are running uh, across the country, we are able to uh, advocate for these nurse anesthetists to be heard 
as being part of the team. So it all comes together from the video system of togetherness, working as a team. So as we go in with these mentorships and uh, we go in as specialists or, uh, you know, um, residents, uh, because there are very few uh, specialists who can travel around, but you also have residents in anesthesia who also do these mentorship programs. And when they see that these people, uh, when we go into these areas, we are able to voice out the needs and show how important the nurses are in providing care for the patients in the district levels, then we are able to you know, make the doctors understand uh, how pivotal the role of the nurse anesthetists is in the team. And uh, it's mainly due to the mentorship, the supportive supervision that we are doing in the country, and uh, also building the capacities of these nurses, telling them, showing them how they can uh, advocate for their needs, showing them how to voice out their needs. So we, we also work together with them closely and try to help them uh, be able to voice their needs for, to the doctors and to the management teams. As a country, we are also having these uh, HMTs, uh, health management teams in the hospitals. So we are trying to uh, make sure that the needs of the nurse anesthetists are presented in, the, in these meetings. So that uh, when, because it's very difficult for a nurse to, go, to prescribe. They're not prescribers, they don't give drugs. So when they need the drugs, it's hard for them to voice out uh, for their needs. But with, through the health management teams in the hospitals, then we are able to uh, provide for their needs in terms of equipment, consumables, and drugs. Uh, yes, uh, things like that. So I think uh, mentorships have played a pivotal role in helping them, uh, the non physicians, to in the care that they provide and working together with the doctors and the specialists. Great. And um, in, in, in a way, maybe you're stealing Judith's thunder because I, I, I also wanted to get that perspective from, from Judith. Uh, Judith, um, you, you, you're a great advocate for theatre nursing. Um, and, and it's only if you've been in the position that I have been in where you realise that the nurses around you actually know more about the job that you're attempting to do, that you, that you, you see the importance of the team. Um, uh, you, you, you've advocated ha what a technically complex area this is, but what are the obstacles that you, have you come across any obstacles in, in building that sort of teamwork? And I'm thinking at each of the levels, because it needs to be at the district hospital level. It also needs to be at the, at the, the referral hospital level and, and also at the national level. And, and maybe tell us a bit about, has Surge Africa, contributed in any way or or maybe even uh, have, have there been any any problems that we haven't really dealt with but what are your what's your perspective on teamwork uh, coming from a nursing a nursing uh, profession um, thank you very much um, that's a very good question actually it touches my heart um, as a theater nurse it's actually very difficult to bring teams together. I'll start with the district hospitals. But before I go there, I want to acknowledge the Royal College of Nursing. They are the ones who came into Zambia to pilot the use of the WHO self-surgery checklist. And they are the ones who advocated for us to start using uh, the briefing sessions and encourage the teams to work together so that we can have positive outcomes of surgery. So the district hospitals, first of all, the numbers of staff are not very good. So when you go into a theater there, you may find one nurse, one doctor who may be even the head of the institution and maybe no anesthetist. You could find maybe a housekeeping man so as we all know, to bring the team together, it has to be these four cadres, the doctors, the nurses, the anesthetists, and the housekeeping staff, because everybody is very important and each one's role is very important in the positive outcome of surgery. You cannot do without the cleaner, the anesthetist, the doctor, or the nurse. So in the district hospitals, when you hold like teamwork or team briefings, you may hold them maybe with just two cadres. You may just find the nurse and the cleaner. The doctor is the head of the institution. He has to attend to managerial work before he can come into theater. So you cannot uh, 
bring out the issues that are affecting everybody. Maybe two people would bring out their issues. What about the doctor? What about the anesthetist? So you find that issues to do with the others who are not part of the team will remain or lag behind. But coming to the tertiary or referral hospitals, here you find all the experts, people who are learned, who know everything about teamwork, but very difficult to bring together. It's very difficult, especially for our senior colleagues, the most senior doctors to be part of the team when we are doing the briefing sessions. Because during briefing sessions, that's where you have an input from everybody, starting from the consultant up to the lowest, I don't want to call them lowest, up to the least person, maybe in the theater. But you find that the consultants will, come, will walk in when they want to come into theater. The other doctors will walk in when they want to come into theater. But I must say we've had very good response from the anesthetists at referral hospitals. The anesthetists will always be there and will be part of the team at any time that you need them. But for the other members of the surgical team, it's quite a big challenge. And I think with uh, Sage Africa's help, we tried to propound this and bring it out wherever we went that it was important for the team to remain a team when they are in theater, because you cannot do without the other. You need to listen to even the least uh, comment from one of the people on the team as you are doing the briefing sessions. So these sessions and the use of the WHO checklist, all this was taught to us by the Royal College of Nursing. But you can imagine even the trainings which were free, doctors were invited, but there were very few, maybe out of 20 doctors to attend the training. So if people don't attend continuous training, it's very difficult for them to be in the place where they are supposed to be or work with the others the way it's supposed to be. So we are still pushing and we appreciate all the work and help from Sage Africa. We have seen the changes in the district hospitals, even the hospitals where you would find the head of the institution, the only doctor attending to managerial issues first, they would walk into theater by the end of the program and you start the theatre day with them, you discuss before you do surgery. So that was positive and uh, very encouraging. And I hope that is continuing. But like I said before, what we need for such areas is continuous mentorship, continuous um, coaching by the experts. But now the question is, the experts who are from the referral hospitals, when they are in their hospitals, they don't want to be part of the team but they want to be in the team when they go outside. We are only hoping that things will change because we are talking about it every day. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna to move to Kuba and then uh, end up with you, Chris, but I, I just throw out a question for uh, any of the speakers, but maybe particularly to uh, Karina, and, 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 uh, Karima and Judith, if we have time at the end, is, is there, just if you feel like saying, is the one thing that Surge Africa brought uh, that stands out in your mind that we haven't mentioned already? And, and the other question, which I'm kind of asking Kuba and, and Chris is lessons for other countries, how, how to replicate it. So I'll start uh, Kuba with, with you uh, on, on that. You, what would you see as, as, as the challenges and what, what would be the, the critical things to think about if we're to now replicate uh, the, the Surge Africa model in, in other countries? Well, thank you for the question. It's a very big one. And that's I, if, if you know, we only have six minutes before the end, so I'll try to kind of cut to the chase of it. I think the, the isolation is something that needs to be, the, the, how, the, the ways through which we were able to melt the ice between different people. I've had so many times through on, in, in, in the workshops that I attended from specialists to say, look, I have never had, I've never, I could never imagine the challenges my district level clinicians face. So there was the, the, the South Africa experience was an eye, eye opener for me to realize what these people do. And then I, I, from that point, they were able to appreciate that. And then 
work together with these people to improve their services, to help them, to support each other, to, 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 to create some sort of an inclusiveness and some sort of a cohesion within the surgical ecosystem. Because historically, surgery was surgeons. Right now, we, we've heard from Karima that surgeons and anesthesia, then we have obstetricians, nurses, so it grows. How about non doctor, uh, physician providers who are non specialists, but yet essential for this particular level of surgery? How about non physician clinicians? How about the porters? How about the, all this stuff that supports surgery? Surgery is a team discipline. So I think the key thing, if we were to scale up anything, we need to start by connecting people and connecting the dots across different disciplines, across different pro, uh, professions. And, and this is the big, the big learning from South Africa, the eye opening experience for people who are historically based at central level once they go down to district level what they see what they experience and the appreciation that comes from it and the, the, the motivation that comes from it in order to help district level hospitals to provide to provide better services Thank yeah you. i think what you really brought across there very clearly is that when we talk about connecting people the connectivity uh, is is very important from from the district level right up to the special the referral hospital up to the national level and i must say in my time in ghana that I, uh, that's what I found was that often people at the national level had very little real understanding of what it was like out in a rural area at, at a district hospital. I think that has been a big achievement uh, of Surge Africa. Chris, um, how, how can we, and, and how, uh, has Surge Africa given us any uh, lessons for how to put district surgery on, on the map? What steps, three things that we need to do now yeah, I'd love to give you lots of steps, but you've asked for three. And I think the, fir the first one would be advocacy. And that is making the public, uh, as well as, as, well as um, those concerned with healthcare, aware of the surgical anesthesia issue. As I said, as I said earlier, um, some of, that's, some of the, lack of, the lack of awareness about surgical issues has been due to the surgical team not being involved. But advocacy, getting the, getting the message out there, that, surg that surgery and anesthesia are needed. The second thing is, um, is, is planning, planning for services and, and, and strategizing within a country and within a region for services. Um, um, policy, getting policy right. And it's exciting to see that um, national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans are starting to be made. Um, the, the, and Karima mentioned these. So advocacy, planning, and then innovate, lastly, innovative ways of, 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 of improving surgery in the district hospital. It was wonderful to see in Surge Africa, the encrypted messaging system actually communicating, uh, communicating bringing people together so that um, clinicians in district hospitals actually really got to know well personally the, the specialists at central hospitals and um, and, and, uh, and, and and could really effectively communicate about uh, patients referrals and advice and follow up and there are so many innovative ways that people are starting to look at improving surgery in district hospitals um, in some of the bigger district hospitals as the number of surgeons is increased actually stationing them there stationing senior trainees with remote monitoring and 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 supervision um <clears throat> we've we've talked a lot about um continued training of the non uh, physician clinicians and with a mentorship scheme and with mentorship comes friendship and comes um mutual support mm. and um and finally what is being talked about in um several several countries now as specialists take jobs at take posts at central hospitals saying actually part of your posts is looking after two or three district hospitals you you know you will it's your contract you will visit hospital a v and c and those visits will say say will bring a strengthening of the of the of the service great thank you chris now um, a couple of questions came in. Uh, it's very important we do mention uh, who has supported the project financially, and it's been the European Commission through the uh, framework uh, FP7 programme and more recently Horizon 2020. Uh, and, and all credit to them, because when we got going, the Lancet Commission on, on Surgery hadn't yet uh, published. They were, they were really, it was 
what I think the Irish would say, they were investing in a, a pig and a poke. They didn't really know what they were going to get. And we didn't know either. But it, it, it really has put um, uh, district surgery on the map. Um, it, it, the other question from, from you, Breda, uh, great to see you on your uh, most faithful attendant of, of, of the webinars. Um, I, what about the focus on service users? Now, we haven't done a lot of explicit research on it, but uh, once it, a, 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 a hospital is providing uh, elective and emergency surgery and doing it safely, it just gets around very quickly. Uh, and I must say, I've never encountered any real reluctance. It's life-saving surgery uh, that is being delivered. And because we have run out of time, maybe I will just throw in uh, one thing at the end. Um, I suppose based on like 25 years of research, and I was doing all the things where there's a very crowded research arena in, in health systems and in HIV infectious diseases. I, I never saw access to senior levels in the ministry, up to you know, um, permanent secretary level, chief medical officers, like we got when we said we wanted to address district level surgery, because it has been a neglected area. It's a huge priority in terms of burden of disease, but it has been neglected by donors for, for far too long. And yet, what I said at the beginning, it's what people want. If you're living in a rural area, um, you want to know that if your wife or if you yourself go into labor and it's obstructed or you're hemorrhaging, or if you have a bad road traffic accident with you know, Chris's area or an acute abdomen, it's young people who, who fall ill and who die. And, and, and it impacts on families, it impacts on communities. It's, it's the catastrophic illnesses um, that are caused by surgically addressable conditions. So go out and uh, if, if, you, if you haven't been con converted by uh, what you've heard today, do read our outputs. They are really good, they're really accessible. And do consider, uh, is there something maybe in your country it could be uh, that could be done in this area because it's it's a real need on the ground, and I'm not sure now whether Nora or or Nadine is going to take over. Thank you, Rory. And just to say, I can speak from behalf of others who are listening and learning like I have, that I am converted, I am convinced, and I have learned a huge amount about the importance of district surgery. Um, and it's also wonderful to see such strong women um, here um, representing different countries and different specialities. And I know Surge Africa has been very supportive of women in surgery and in um, in all, all professions. So so well done, everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time today. Um, thank you, Surge Africa, for the great work you're doing. Um, we do have an evaluation for everybody. Um, always important to find out what people think. Please fill in the evaluation if you if you have a little bit of time, please. Um, we have another webinar coming up on Friday, which is going to be looking at the, uh, the response to the situation in India with COVID-19. So please do tune in for one hour on, um, on Friday, if you can, the same, the same time. Um, and the webinar, of course, will be available on YouTube. So you're all very welcome to keep sharing that. And to uh, if you miss something or you want to see it again, please, uh, please do that. So thank you.